So hi, good afternoon, everyone, and, and welcome to uh, this call on uh, data science. I'm going to do the introductions in a minute, as always. But while you're dialing onto the call, a quick reminder that obviously we want to encourage people to participate, to post their questions. Um, I've got loads of questions lined up. We only have 45 minutes. John's very kindly giving up his time to answer as many as possible. So I'm going to certainly kick things off and, and rattle a few that I really want to get into the detail of. But actually, this is your call. So all of your suggestions are more than welcome. Um, John, I don't know if I've got the pronunciation right, but a, form, a warm welcome to you. It's John uh, Mukham Ramway. Is that correct? Yeah, that's perfect, Colin. And as we were just on the pre-beef and you've just literally told me I can't uh, not mention that, but, yeah. <laughs> but you're laughing at <laughs> gathering Mukul Ramway, and that's exactly what we're doing now, which I think is quite um, appropriate. So thanks for joining me on the call. Let's start um, just by asking the most basic question. What do you do at Standard Bank, John? Cool. Uh, thanks, Colin, and uh, welcome, everybody. So I'm currently the head of uh, CIB Digital Insights. So basically what CIB means is um, it's our corporate investment banking franchise within the Standard Bank groups. Uh, so we basically deal with business to business capabilities. If you uh, think uh, of the likes of your uh, Vodacom, so your South African Airways, your ESCOMs, all those type of big uh, corporates, uh, we, we do business with them. So I'm the, currently the head of Digital Insights, which looks at how we leverage off data and our capabilities, uh, be it data science, machine learning, AI, to either better improve the client experience or to look for new revenue opportunities. Lovely, that's great. Now, we're going to go through quite a few uh, themes here. We want to understand uh, more about what you actually do. We want to understand uh, the promise of data science, whether it's over or under delivered over the years and where it sits at the moment, what the progression's been to understand a little bit about where we are today with new technologies, whether that's opening possibilities or whether it's all hype um, and how you're actually using it. We obviously want to then touch on what things are going to be looking like in the future. And if you're willing and able and allowed um, to talk about some of those secret projects that you've been running on in the uh, in the basement floors of Standard Bank. Um, I'll try and to, what I'll try <laughs> to do. So we've got quite a lot on the agenda. Let's just start with the most basic of questions, though, because it's used, uh, I think, incredibly frequently, but I don't actually know really what it means when you think about it. What is a data scientist? What is data science um, as a, kind of a skill set? Yeah, so I think you'd like to imagine that, uh, you know, we all deal with data in different fashions, right? So at the core of it, we are all data scientists, we are all data analysts, right? But where the came really, um, uh, the term really came uh, about from was, you know, if you look at astrophysicists, right, um, they were dealing with millions and millions of uh, cosmic data, and they need uh, big powered uh, computers, uh, and which could store all of this immense amount of data, they needed uh, bespoke algorithms to be able to surface insights from that data, and to be able to take action. And hence, uh, then the term that came about, which was data science, which was really the kind of like unicorn you'd want to um, uh, call it, um, which is a person who encompasses both the understanding of computer science, mathematics, statistics, as well as um, you know uh, economics to be able to drive value from the data. Okay, so so we're no clearer for a definition then, because it's just basically taking anything you can possibly think of relating to data and just throwing it into one big pot. I assume there's some sort of professional body that's been set up, like you have, you know, chartered institutes for accountants, and you've got CPI. Do we have something like that for uh, data scientists? Yeah, so unfortunately, it has been our downfall, right? Um, and I think probably the highlight, I would say, in the last 10 years was probably when uh, President uh, Barack Obama, uh, the US, uh, then US president, uh, appointed a chief data science uh, office or chief data scientist, which really brought in a lot of momentum you know, within this space. But what we have subsequently seen is that these so-called unicorns are not easily available, right? If you look at our type of education that we have, you've got people who are specialists in different domains, right? So essentially what then ended up happening with the data science profession is that it started disintegrating, right? Or if you could call it um, fragmenting into core capabilities. So you guys were very good at infrastructure, setting up infrastructure for big data capabilities, for real-time data, for unstructured data, so you uh, people were specialized in that, and then you also had people who were specialized in the computing uh, capability, you know, making the computers be able to run these algos faster, uh, faster and so forth, right? 
And then you came to the data itself, right? You had your uh, traditional um, actuarial scientists, statisticians, you name, you name them. We were very good at creating bespoke algorithms, but now we're seeing more like, uh, you know, uh, guys from, uh, you know, engineering backgrounds, like beat uh, electro engineering, mechanical engineering, really taking forward uh, the data science capability into more machine learning. And then uh, finally, you also had, um, then the business, uh, you know, uh, domain or uh, capability where your data storytellers would use visualization tools such as maybe it could be basic PowerPoint presentation, it could be uh, Power BI, you know, any other uh, you know, capability that you'd be able to translate your data into insights uh, for, uh, for, for, for your audience. And ultimately, the person or the role that brought all of these things together was what we call a data product manager. So they acted as the key orchestrator in bringing all these from augmented roles into one capability that would then be able to drive value for um, uh, for whatever project that you are actually um, encountering. Okay, now I don't want to get you in, in uh, trouble. Um, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're in a compromised position, but we're going to potentially do that anyway. The question that is, is really been bothering me for the last day, is, I, are data scientists basically overpaid cost centers who historically have delivered very, very little amounts of value for most organizations? And I, I say that with the greatest respect for you and your colleagues in the field, because I realize how much training you have to go through and, and you fully deserve the incredibly large paychecks that you get at the end of the month after that level of training. <laughs> But the output is what I'm questioning. Am I being rather uh, rude here or is there an element of truth in this? I hope my boss is on the call, by the way, uh, Colin, now that you've mentioned that. Um, so, yeah, I think we have seen highlights such as, you know, um, be it, uh, you know, be it uh, certain bespoke or niche uh, companies, you know, paying crazy amounts for these data scientists or AI engineers. I think you guys might have seen actually last week um, an article from Netflix where they actually brought in a guy from uh, ChatGPT and they had to give him a certain fee of, um, I think, a million bucks or whatever the case may be. But at the core of it, right, if you look at the traditional data science capability, it was this unicorn who was able to understand, you know, difficult infrastructure right? New infrastructure, open source infrastructure, uh, compute um, uh, the uh, bespoke algorithms, be able to develop bespoke algorithms, be able to serve insights to clients in various forms. And, you know, so then that, that brought about, you know, the term, uh, you know, data scientist, uh, data scientist as a unicorn, and obviously there was a premium to that value, right? But what we then also subsequently saw was that because of a lack of a professional body, many roles naturally transformed to be data science or data scientists um, so that they can also be able to tap into, you know, the, the, the growth curve or, the, you know, if you know what I mean. Uh, and, and, and therefore there was this, this uh, sudden disillusionment within the market about what a true data scientist is and what value they, they can bring to an organization. But also I have to say that it takes two to tango, right? So um, if I'm, um, you know, I'm a company owner, be it a small uh, company, medium-sized company, or even a corporate company, you know, uh, I need to first understand what is the client pain point or the business pain point that I'm trying to solve before I actually set up the data science capability. And knowing that the data science capability is only the tip of the ice, iceberg, right? You are actually have the data collected. Um, and is that data collected in the, uh, in the right way so that we can be able to extract value? And are there proper governance and privacy and ethics that are there in terms of governing this such sensitive information? And ultimately then I can be able to exploit that to drive um, new insights for my clients, uh, new experiences or even new revenue opportunities for your business. So, so hence, you know, you had this, you know, to and fro around some data scientists being uh, overpaid, but on the other spectrum, the data scientists themselves being disillusioned by what it actually means um, without the actual appropriate ecosystem around them. Yeah, and I think uh, Sean Roberts there, he's, he's uh, summed it up quite nicely. Perhaps you're not uh, overpaid, you're underappreciated and underutilized. And certainly that resonates with my experience in numbers of organizations. Why do you think that is the case? What is it that makes it difficult for senior leadership to really um, get the benefit that data scientists can bring and turn it into profit or cost reduction or efficiency or just general improvements in their businesses? Yeah, so I think the first part is that, you know, with everything, there's always a marketing gimmick, right? I think you've seen with ChatGPT that 
uh, people who thought that you could solve everything and and so forth, right? So it could literally, uh, you know, um, uh, what you call it, replace every other profession. I think there was a sense of that overselling uh, at the uh, uh, um, at the formative years of uh, data science. But much more importantly, I think um, you know companies took it as a magic wand uh, to actually appoint data scientists without necessarily having had years of, you know, um, you know uh, storing this data, you know, enabling this data to be exploited. And by the time you get the data scientist on board, you, he, he or she can't actually show the value that is there because they're spending 80% of their time trying to see if they can figure out that if they can actually create some, you know, use case or some value that um, can be presented to business. Fortunately, we, uh, from a startup bank perspective, we took it the other way around. We knew of our limitations, right? Right? So we we um, we approach the problem in different in a different form, right? With on one component with a very successful uh, graduate program where we knew that um, it was going to be very difficult to get um, you know the requisite skills. So rather uh, bring uh, bring the young talent from varsity. They've been exposed to all of these exp uh, open source technologies and be able to train them up with the right business acumen and so forth so that they can be able to deliver value. The second component was actually to get, you know, different product managers within the business lines themselves, right? Upskill them, uh, you know, partner with an external academic uh, institution, uh, you know, and help them upskill in terms of what uh, data and, um, and data science can do for you. And then the last piece, uh, piece was actually with the client impact itself, right? Are we putting the right metrics and the right measurements in place so that whenever there's an actual data use case that is there, we first are certain if a data scientist is needed and if a data scientist is needed, what is the value to be had and uh, are we able to actually measure that value? And then how are we able to even measure the experience um, uh, from a client perspective? So using that formula, we've managed to actually be able to you know, uh, successfully navigate around some of those challenges around disillusionment of uh, data science. So I'm, I'm going to make a statement and we'll come back to it in a bit. Um, my statement is that companies that can effectively use data and therefore need data scientists to help them to do that have a massive uh, competitive advantage. And an example of someone that's um, fully aware of that is Roger Krobler in Stellenbosch. He's got the Ethos AI Fund. He only invests in organizations where they believe they've got potential uplift because of the use of data. He comes from an insurance background, so that's a clear match to his experiences at Real Insurance and, and Hollard. But I agree with that across the board, pretty much for most organizations. I was chatting with an organization that um, really just catches, produces, and distributes fish. You know, just something as simple as that. When you go and realize the billions of fish that they actually cache, the numbers are massive. And then thinking about how you do the distribution effectively, huge opportunities. So it's very difficult to think of a business that can't benefit um, from using data. But the problem is that data to me is a bit like seawater. It's everywhere, it's full of salt and you can't drink it. Yeah. So you, you can't use it. It's really hard to get hold of because it's unstructured. It's wrong. That's error prone. It's too slow. There's too much of it. Where do we start? There's so many um, issues with it. How do you go about resolving um, these issues with data so you can actually be effective? Okay, cool. Thanks for that, Colin. You know, like uh, my uh, my leader always uh, says, right? Uh, don't boil the ocean. Whatever you do, don't boil the ocean. So I mean, we've got oceans of data um, sitting everywhere. But I think uh, much more importantly, right? Um, you always have to start with the problem that you're trying to solve, for, right? Um, so don't do something for the sake of doing that, right? And it doesn't matter which sector you are in, right? Um, it could be within the financial services, it could be in the manufacturing sector, it could be within um, the medical sector, it doesn't really matter. What is the problem that you're solving for, right? And with that problem, is there data? Firstly, is the data that is there available? And what are you currently doing with that data to actually solve that problem, right? And maybe you're able to partially solve that problem, or maybe you're able to fully solve the problem, right? So what is that incremental X factor that you are looking for from your data? So I'll give a classic example, right? Maybe you might be a medical doctor, right? And um, a, a patient comes in, right? And you're only able to get the readings at that point in time of a patient, right? But now if you've got like these things such as smart devices, you know, your, your iPhones and so forth, they're able to track data seamlessly over time, right? And you, if you give your doctor permission to have sight of that data, 
the doctor is actually able to have much more informed uh, uh, decisioning or a much more much more informed insight as to what ailment you might actually be more prone to and therefore actually uh, you know uh, improve in that uh, it could be pre precision medicine or preventative uh, medicine so that um, example applies everywhere right your clients are telling you ev everything all the time right if you look at the data and the right type of data that you need to look for as well that is where um, you know uh, external governance bodies such as a data office comes into play right what is the actual right amount of data that you need to keep how do you then respect the governance processes and the governance elements right the solutions that you are building do they have privacy by design do they have ethics by design you know all of that it can be an afterthought right they have to be actually ingrained in your technical um, systems that you actually store tra store transfer and uh, you know, uh, exploit your data. So there are all of these nuggets that are there that allows you to really narrow down on the type of data that you need and uh, to, to understand problems. And with the right KPIs and KRAs, you're able to actually see the full value of the data, right? You won't be overwhelmed by boiling the ocean, but you're actually just narrowing down to the data that you ab absolutely need for, uh, for you to solve that, um, that problem. What about um, when we look at, um, I mean, Standard Bank's a huge organization. Um, which gives you uh, both <laughs> costs and benefits in terms of running data science. You can certainly afford it as a bank, but obviously the, the stack, the vastness of the data and the number of distributed systems that you have <laughs> makes it tricky. But what about smaller entities? A lot of the guys on the call here, you know, in, in smaller businesses, non-listed, private family-owned businesses, small, medium enterprises and, and large enterprises. Have you got any um, suggestions for them? And, and I'm really thinking about the structure because you you kind of, uh, do you need to get, for example, everything on the cloud to get onto one system? You need to get on Azure, or if you've made the decision it's got to be AWS, um, and you've got to go and use these platforms. I can only use, you know, business intelligence from Microsoft, or, you know, we're going to... Is there any kind of uh, views on how you structure the different systems so that you can utilize data? Yeah, so thanks for that, Colin, right? You know, I'll use a classical example of a company that... Um, you know, has actually been very successful in this, uh, you know, in this type of uh, business, Microsoft, right? If you come to think of it, Microsoft Excel, literally almost everybody on the call is with Microsoft Excel, right? And you're able to do your calculations. And some, yes, uh, they are novice uh, Excel um, guys and some are more advanced, right? And we need to get data science in that, uh, you know, to that space where it's actually easily accessible, democratizable, and also actually anybody can leverage off and utilize it, right? So how you would go about it is that, um, you know, break down your data science maturity uh, curve or maturity journey into three phases, right? There's the infrastructure phase, right? We can be quite intimidating if you're a big corporate, you know, because of all these uh, big data uh, capabilities and so forth, right? But if I'm a, um, you know, if I'm a, a small company and I've got some data science capabilities, there's a lot of off-the-shelf, uh, you know, uh, third-party providers who could be on cloud or even on on-prem on that you can leverage for them to set up the infrastructure for you. You just need to tell them that look, this is the amount of data that I have. This is the type of complex problem that I have. Is it real-time data coming in? Is it data that is coming in at the end of the day? What type of data do I need to store? They will set up that infrastructure for you, right? And then you go to the data itself, right? Some of the knowledge you already have, right? So you can easily answer that. But also at the same time, there's now a lot of off-the-shelf capabilities and tools that you can literally plug into your data and be able, in a no-code environment, you don't need a, a tech geek, you don't need a data science geek to be able to create this fancy algos for you. They've got, you know, traditional algos that you can literally, you know, uh, embed on top of that data and you're able to run those, uh, you know, uh, those codes. So, and uh, if you look at even some of the latest uh, tools that are coming from Google, uh, you know, we've got uh, things such as PyTorch, Keras, and all of that, that are being made much more simplified, uh, you know, so that you are able to leverage off that capability. And much more importantly now, on the, on the final side, which is around creating visuals, right? Probably that might be the easier side because we're all cre um, probably familiar with creating chats in some form. We're able to create uh, visuals of uh, different kinds. You need to be clear on what type of, 
insight you're trying to create, right? Is it a once a month type of insight? Is it an ongoing insight? Or is it something that you might want to see once in a while? That then allows you to partner with, it could be a web app developer who's able to, you know, you know, um, uh, plug in your visuals into a web app, or it could be, you know, using some, you know, off the shelf open sourced, um, you know, uh, Excel uh, uh, file capabilities that are able to allow you to visualize. And you've got a bit of budget as well. I mean, things like uh, Power BI type are also available for you to be able to easily visualize your data. And the real challenge is when, if the data is then a bit more real time and you need to constantly stream it in, then you might need you know, a third party uh, partner that will allow you to be able to seamlessly do that uh, repetitively, by the way. Mm. So that's a little bit about the stack. Um, what about you? Know, I mean, you mentioned real time and then I wanted to talk more about the, the sort of people models, but you mentioned you know, real time. Has there been a big shift in technology over the four or five you know, years uh, preceding where we are today, where we've seen um, new options for people to get access to real-time data? I mean, those big, massive you know, SQL databases are not particularly useful when you need your data fast and at scale to actually go and do really good um, decision-based analytics, as far as I'm aware, anyway. Yeah. So if you actually look at your social media capabilities, right, be it Facebook, Twitter, and all of that, you know, all of these guys are actually using real-time capabilities, right? But the one that has really cracked it is TikTok, right? If you come to think of it, right, um, with TikTok, the way they've done, uh, they've gone about it is that they've got an element which they're able to memorize whatever users are doing, right, over time. But then at the same time, as you are actually scroll scrolling through um, TikTok, they're actually in real time be able to update you and to give you more relevant content as you are actually scrolling through that, right? So that is um, the real time capability. And likewise, from a banking perspective, we've had this, uh, the same type of challenges, right? How do we move from, you know, our systems are online, 24 seven on in all of that, right? But the data capabilities uh, themselves, right, are quite pricey for you to be able to do that en masse, you know, in real time. So we have had to, you know, slowly gravitate towards real time capabilities because we do believe that the best client experience is when you're able to respond promptly and decisively at the point of um, or at the point of interaction, or what we call a moment of truth when the uh, client is interacting with your platform, right? So with that, right, we we have uh, ultimately taken two strategies, right? So one strategy is about uh, the one platform that we have, right? I think um, you're quite familiar with the one platform, which is a um, uh, a corporate uh, B2B platform, which allows third party providers to load their applications uh, and also to interact with our clients and to also create um, you know, new revenue streams that, are, that um, we have not been able to tap into you know, from an ecosystem perspective, right? So with that, we actually do have real-time decision in mind, right? So we build with real-time decision in mind, and therefore the infrastructure itself becomes a bit less costly if you if you then scale it up, right? But all the traditional systems, uh, that is where it's a bit tricky, right? Because, um, you know, you've got a lot of data nuances, data in different structures. They were never, some of the production systems or product systems were never designed with the view that somebody might want to view uh, stuff in real time in the future. So you have to balance between what you're going to do in the traditional systems and what you're going to do in the in the new digital systems. So rather have that by design already in the new systems, but the traditional systems then find a way of actually, um, you know, uh, incorporating that real time, real time data. And we move at the pace of the market. Now we've got event streams from AWS, you know, you've got Kafka that I think you're quite familiar with all of that. We we, we leverage off that, uh, uh, of our uh, big data platforms that we have invested in, yeah. I'm loving, by the way, the fact that as as we're chatting this, <laughs> not only so many questions that are coming through, but I love the way that the audience are answering them. There's some absolutely fantastic answers uh, yeah. there as well. So I, please keep doing that because what I'll make sure is that we download the chat and send it back out to uh, to everyone um, pretty much as is so that you've got some of those links and uh, some of the details, especially Paul, thank you very much for the, uh, the sort of responses you've been given uh, too. Um, Question again around uh, resourcing, and it's a difficult one because every company is different, but let's let's work on the basis. If you're big enough to employ and do employ, say, a CTO, you have a head of technology in your in your company, if you're that sort of size, do you think you should basically always then be hiring a data scientist full time to bring into that type of organization? Or 
is it something where you can actually still, and today, or maybe it's becoming easier, actually use fractional data scientists, outsource to third parties who run those services for you, um, even if it's on a full-time basis, because it's, it's, the price point is still pretty good there. Cool. Thanks, Colin. I think really at the core of it is, as a business, you need to decide what your IP is and where your secret source is, right? Where is your magic in your business, right? That definitely, obviously, you don't want to outsource, right? Because that is what brings you competitive advantage, right? But, um, you know, if, if you, um, you know, even if you are a big uh, corporate uh, entity, you may decide to say, look, uh, one element is to partner with an external fintech that can help me learn something that can be of value, but at the same time, upskill the existing staff members, right? Because, you know, with the amount of open source te- um, academic institutions that are there, it's now getting much and much easier for people to transition from different roles into data science, machine learning, and AI capabilities, right? It's no longer as um, you know, uh, mystified as it was uh, maybe five to 10 years ago, right? Once you've answered that question, right? Maybe the next part will also be a case of what is it that I want to do in-house? What is that I want to entirely outsource, right? So from our perspective, um, we do have a partnership with um, Stellenbosch um, University School of Data Science and Computational Thinking. And we do believe that, I mean, with that partnership, it allows us to actually ex- uh, get extended um, capabilities around the way we are thinking about certain problems, the networks that they also have, right? With other supply chains, with other people who are coming with the varying problems to the school that allows us to actually connect across um, uh, varying ecosystems. And also much more importantly, it allows us and our clients to actually leverage off the school's capability to also co-create and innovate um, a new, um, new capabilities um, you know, within that. So it's a fine, you know, it's a, it's a fine line between do I build, uh, partner or buy, you know, you have to look at the DNA. But, but if you look, uh, just, just interjecting there, build, partner, buy, you're saying that in pretty much every case, you should be doing one of those. We're no longer in a world where you should just be ignoring it. Well, let's look at it for, as an example, right? Will we ever have the budget to build uh, chat GPT as a foundational model? Not as it stands at the moment, right? Right, not as it stands. I mean, um, the, I was talking to the guys from OpenAI, they spent probably a couple of billion dollars, right? Building mm-hmm. that, you know, um, you know, that foundational model, right? And then with the support of uh, Microsoft and other partners, obviously. Now, it's something that we can't afford, right? So it's something that we're gonna get from the market. But what we can do, what we can do is to build and leverage off some of those external capabilities, right? And build on top of that. So we can partner with a third party uh, provider who's actually, uh, you know, had exposure to such technologies and be able to leverage all of that. And now we're actually able to then get to a position where you're actually getting the same value, but at a fraction of the cost. Interesting. David Moran, do you agree with this statement? Outsourcing IP dev is dangerous, but partnering with externals can give you a huge benefit. Do you think it's dangerous nowadays to outsource IP? Well, um, I think, you know, we, we are very much uh, transitioning into the world of open, right? You know, uh, it could be open banking, open sourcing of capabilities, and open innovation, basically, right? And, you know, mm. you, honestly, when I type on innovation by always viewing everything as IP, you need to be very de- deliberate, right? And that is where, like, um, you know, uh, you know, having an office like a data office, you know, within your organization can really help you to actually, you know, unpack what might be IP to you, or what might, uh, you know, uh, what might you be free to actually, you know, expose externally. So in conjunction with your data office, with your business partners and your data science capability, you know, we need to actually, you know, uh, enable the open communities to, uh, to drive uh, additional value from, uh, from these capabilities. So, but if we deem everything as IP, we're gonna start for innovation, you know? So we That's need to move forward. Let's try, let's have a crack at this uh, question from Dr. Um, Basso, but we can use a, a case study for it as well. His question is how do we monetize data? So, so it kind of goes back to where we started. This is your chance, John, to prove that you're worth it. Um, one of the projects that you've got going, well, you can, we can use that as the kind of case study and you try to convince us that you're actually going to be able to monetize data from Smart Nudge. Do you want to just talk about that? All right, cool. So Smart and Nudge. 
it says, make it practical, please. So you've been warned. All right, all right, I'll try as much as possible. So we have been on this journey, um, you know, probably for the last four, four and a half years to five years, right? As corporate investment banking, right? Whereby we were seeing, you know, that firstly, we've done quite a decent job in terms of upskilling and training our talent to be more data savvy. Uh, we've done quite a decent job to set up data governance and data uh, capabilities, be it compliance, governance, and all of the bells and whistles, and as well as the digital transformation journey, right? But what we quickly realized was that data is going to be a core of literally everything that we do, right? And like, as I've mentioned uh, earlier on, you know, you do ethics by design when you're building something new, you do privacy by design, and you also do data by design, right? So from there, right, you are then now able to be able to say, look, with the strategy that I'm pursuing, right? Um, and it has to be a strategy led, right? Um, with the strategy that I'm pursuing, I'm trying to build a platform, I'm trying to build um, a, a, a capability, but how am I going to allow clients to interact, to share ideas, to collaborate, to, you know, to further, you know, a value amongst themselves uh, where I'm actually just a conduit. And they, uh, they came about the idea around Smart Nudge, right? Smart Nudge is our core recommendation platform, right? Um, which firstly helps uh, obviously our internal front office sales force, uh, be it um, you know, to help their clients with uh, trading, uh, be it uh, liquidity management, cash flow management, cash flow optimization, working capital solutions, something that has been really quite you know, uh, powerful in bringing our businesses together. And surely the, uh, if we are having these problems as a big corporate, our clients are probably also having the same problem, right? So how do we then now go and expand and extend these capabilities to our other corporate clients so that they're able to solve their own problems by themselves, but also much more importantly, they're able to come back to the other one, one platform and be able to co uh, connect with other clients, other partners, create new business opportunities and create new client experiences yeah, for, for themselves. You said earlier that you um, recommend to people that you kind of start with a clear problem and, and then you build your prototype around that. So start small, see if it works, and then you can scale from there. What was the initial uh, problem statement that you're trying to fix here? And what was the initial sort of test case that you run, which is, is presumably gone well because it's given you the, the um, support from your colleagues to get the budget to go and start scaling this? Yeah. So the first thing that we uh, realized quickly, right, was that you know, we are, we are a bank, we are a trusted brand, right, amongst our clients, right? So we're not in the, into, the day, uh, into the game of data monetization, right? We're in the game of data commercialization, which is about using and leveraging all the data that we have to enable the cl uh, clients to gain better business, uh, more business, more, um, you know, more opportunities, right? So that was the first starting point. Then the second piece was that we do have a very defined framework that um, we actually undertake uh, within the area. We call it the Think Wrong. I think some of you guys might have heard of that um, acronym. Uh, it's a design thinking methodology where you test your ideas. And through that phase, we're able with our product managers and product development managers and our scouters be able to narrow down what were the key client pain points, right? And what is it that needs to be solved for from a, a data perspective to be able to um, uh, to enhance uh, clients to be able to uh, look for new opportunities and drive digital client experience. So through this funnel, we have to we have to literally go from you know you you designing client testing prototyping test um, you know pilot uh, with a pilot set of um, users embedded internally, making sure that uh, that whatever we want to um, you know expose to our clients, we've also we are also using and utilizing and we're seeing value. And then finally now the scaling element which, which we are now exposing to um, to our clients. So it's a very rigorous process which has got um, a specific um, what we call stage gates uh, which we need to you know internally prove um, and also externally prove with our clients so that we can actually move through these different phases. And now we're at that uh, tail end where we are actually going to be able to expose this um, insights uh, to our clients, not only across um, you know, South Africa, but across different sectors, across different geographical regions, and also across our uh, different products. As you guys know, we are a very diversified business. So do you think that uh, data scientists and the data that, you know, the technology is available now could potentially bring us to a point where we actually do feel like we've got a relationship with our banks again? And where I'm going there is if you think back, you know, 60 or even not that long ago, perhaps 30 or 40, if you're a small business or, or reasonably sized business, you've got a very close relationship with your bank manager. You're probably in the Rotary Club. 
Um, and when it comes to organizing working capital and thinking about the FX and interest rates, there's a call that you make and it's almost your colleague that you're talking to. But because he's so connected with so many other businesses, he's able to give you advice that goes perhaps beyond uh, the traditional banking that we're used to now. Yes, uh, we can give you the loan, but perhaps you should also you know, speak to this company. They're also a client of ours. Uh, there's a good relationship. You can do your import and export together. He could be the person that's going to help advise on X, Y, Z. So you had this community that was built up to actually do more than just financing to help grow businesses. Are you saying with things like smart nudge and technology and data scientists, we could be heading back to that just on a much more automated and scalable basis? We we are definitely on the on our pathway to that, right? I mean, just just come to think of it, right? All of us as human beings, right? We are on, um, be it, I don't know, social media, be it Facebook, TikTok, Twitter. Uh, we're using things like Uber, um, you know, all of these capabilities and experiences that we're having externally, right? They are very, you know, uh, they're very responsive to our needs. Um, they're very personalized. And therefore, at the same time, uh, one would expect the same kind of experience with their banking partner, right? And hence, we are actually, you know, uh, you know, all on our way uh, moving towards that. You know, when you have got our smartest capabilities, um, we're able to incorporate our data with your data, obviously with the right uh, privacy, ethical considerations, regulatory considerations, all of that, right? And we're able to now actually, you know, be in a position where, where we interact you in, uh, with you in a much more qualitative way. We've got better decisioning. You know, just imagine a case in point whereby maybe your credit score wasn't good, right? Or isn't good enough, it's borderline. But you're able to say, you know, guys, I can give you this additional information for you to be able to make a better decision about whether I need this business loan approved or not. That is the kind of like, you know, um, you know, um, uh, avenue that we're moving to, uh, leveraging off all that alternative data to be able to have that holistic, personalized experience with you. You think data scientists is going to get cheaper um, and easier to, to access over the next couple of years? And if so, why? What is it that's pushing it um, in that potential direction? Effectively, are we going to be seeing the democratization of data scientists um, as technology you know, continues to uh, develop in multiple spheres? So the first thing is that, um, you know, data science is not going to go uh, away, right? Uh, all the uh, innovation that's happening is literally going to require more data scientists to be able to help us, you know, uh, infer and uh, be able to make better decisions. But I think where the true value is, is what we call this citizen data scientist capabilities, where we are in, uh, giving people and empowering people with tools and capabilities to do a lot of the work by themselves, right? Without necessarily having to require uh, strong technical capabilities, um, strong, um, you know, and big investments, but to be able to use it like a calculator, you know, the way you use your calculator on your phone, the way you use, um, you know, your phone to take uh, pictures should be the same way you use uh, and utilize data science. And I think we're getting the, a lot of the information is getting, um, you know, demystified through a lot of learning platforms, you know, and I encourage the guys on the call, you know, you know, go to Udemy, go to Coursera, go to all these open source um, platforms, even try out a competition on Kaggle as an example and see how you fare amongst your peers, um, you know, and that will be your, uh, you know, the start of your journey into uh, machine learning and data science. So definitely it's going to be more democratized. In terms of, um, you know, chip, right? Chip is relative, right? Uh, <laughs> so it all depends how we're going to evolve, right? So I think the first part is that we all know and we can appreciate that our open AI is going to be very much augmented into our lives, and there's going to be further innovation, um, uh, you know, around that as well. But what that would mean is that you know we are actually able to be more efficient, right? and use our time much more wisely on the things that we need to um, spend our time on. And the things that we don't really need and that are repetitive, we can do that away with, right? So you actually now get to a position whereby not necessarily data science getting cheaper, but actually the exponential value of getting stuff from data science becomes a reality. So here, here's a, um, a look into the future. Um, there's massive opportunity. So there's a, it's a hypothesis, let's phrase it like that made up of a couple of components. The, the main hypothesis is that every single company that better utilizes data in some way, shape or form has a competitive advantage for multiples of reasons across virtually every single industry. Their ability to do this is getting cheaper and easier 
and more present on that first hypothesis because of numbers of factors. We've got cloud, uh, we've got um, Apache Kafka, we've got artificial intelligence. Uh, more importantly, perhaps we've got millions and millions of data scientists because universities in India and China and South Africa across the globe are pumping them out in numbers that we've never seen before. And we're also seeing groups, you know, you mentioned Kaggle, for example, where there's massive communities that's coming together. So we're seeing huge demand, which is increasing supply. It's getting cheaper. The technology is getting easier to use. And this is just the starting point. And if you really look at it as a kind of a curve, your, your acceleration in, in processing power continues to double down every single year, Moore's law and so on. So we've got these different technologies. It seems to me like a no brainer that those that can access data and and these trends have an advantage. But the problem is that what I see as a no-brainer is not the same if you're a C-suite executive, because they seem to struggle to understand the power of data and they, they, they don't seem to necessarily grasp it, you know, in the way that I've just described. Why do you think it is, and this goes back to an earlier comment as well, where we see the senior leadership, uh, you're actually having to go to sell data scientists to them and you get caught up in a budget cycle and you're competing against other uh, resources where they want to go and spend the money and you go, no, but this is crazy because if you do this, you're just going to improve sales and yet it sort of gets lost in the mix. Why, why is that happening and what can the data scientist teams do better to try to get their stories across? Yeah, I mean, that's a, such a, a very uh, important uh, point, right? Uh, and I think primarily that stems from the fact that firstly, right, uh, the decisioning around data and data science were, was being made at much lower levels, right? So in terms of, uh, you know, general managers creating data science capabilities within their streams of work and so forth, right? So you'd find that as you go up the hierarchy, the message gets a bit filtered, right? And the appreciation of data science is not necessarily um, um, there, right? So, but what we've now seen in the last couple of years is that, you know, we now have got things such as chief analytical officer, chief data analytical officer. So we're now actually getting people who are data centric right there on the boards of companies, right? And they're able to actually share with their peers and their colleagues, you know, um, the value of data. And if you look at, uh, for example, in our structures, uh, within corporate investment banking, Literally at all management tiers, there is now a data capability, a data role, right? Bit all the way from junior staff members to senior executives and directors, we've got data capabilities. So that will then actually allow us to sell the message much easier and actually allow us to get to the problems much quicker and to actually realize at the core of it, it's not a data problem, right? It's a client problem that you're solving for. Right. And I think that was being lost a lot. And uh, therefore, C-suite execs um, were not getting that message that actually it was this client uh, problem that was being solved for. And that is the connection to the data and how we've utilized the data to solve for that client problem. But uh, we are seeing that um, move quite rapidly, uh, you know, uh, across organizations is uh, data filters um, uh, across all of these hierarchies. And I need to also emphasize, right, I mean, uh, you know, around hierarchies, uh, a modern digital team has got what you call uh, a much more flatter structure, right? And even, you know, with the new graduates that are coming out of our universities, going to the workplace, they want to have access to the same executive, executives, right? As quickly as possible. They don't want to go through the traditional hierarchies of, I need to talk to that manager that talks to that manager. So it is, in essence, uh, what we've also created in our um, capability is, uh, is uh, this networked influence, right? Where anyone within the data science community has access to a C-suite executive, right? It's very easy for you to call, call your director, very easy to set up a type of coffee, share with them the type of work that you're doing and how much impact it is actually creating for business. And also starting to get that client feedback, you know, when clients are saying, geez, I actually didn't realize that you guys knew of this problem before I actually found out about it, you know? Examples like that will start changing the mindset. And they've actually started changing the mindset within um, our business, certainly. It will start changing the mindset around uh, C-suite executives uh, being um, not necessarily being data savvy. They're actually data savvy. Most of them have got things such as MBAs, which have got a data component on that. So I think it's really about setting the data capability, data capability being set up in the right way Organo, uh, from an organogram perspective, all the way from the bottom to the top, but also allowing the junior guys to have access to the guys right at the top. All right, last question, I think, because we're about to run out of time. Is there a future for data scientists? And where I'm going there is many predict the end of needing programmers because of uh, generative language models and other aspects of AI. 
Uh, what about data scientists? Are you feeling safe? Are you seeing these technologies as empowering and allowing you to do more? Or actually, it's going to wipe you out because we don't need your intelligence. I can go and type a one-liner into chat GBT 7.3 in a couple of years' time and solve all ills when it comes to data. Yeah. So, I'll, you know, I'll answer it by giving you a classical example, right? You know, when I used to work for my, um, uh, in my previous role, uh, you know, with a bunch of very young, talented uh, group of guys, you know, would uh, literally start our models on a Monday, leave them running overnight, and sometimes they finish running uh, on a Thursday, on a Friday. You know what does that? What, what that meant was number one, you were leaving the office late. You were leaving at like eleven p.m. Right. Number two, you do not you do not know what you, need, you needed to fix until you get the outcome. Now all of that is now being done like that, right? What that basically means is that instead of your data scientist being able to do uh, three models in a year, they're able to do 100 models in a year, right? So in essence, our ability to actually prove value is becoming much more easier, right? Mm -hmm. And in the same vein, I've seen articles talking about, you know, you won't need a lawyer tomorrow, you won't need this type of profession. It's not, it's not that way, right? It's about actually the lawyers and the professionals and the accountants, the doctors who are actually using data at their core are going to have a very big competitive advantage over some uh, over their peers who are not utilizing data. And the last point is that, you know, with this data creating information asymmetry, right, um, is going to allow the underperforming or the low performing talent to actually catch up and be a par with your top level data scientists, right? So you don't necessarily, you won't necessarily need to have 10 years of experience to get into a senior data scientist role. You're going to be able to show them that much quicker. So therefore the actual chance and opportunity for data science, scientists to show value is actually going to be more, uh, much, far much greater than it was before, you know, because of those technological limitations. So I wouldn't actually say data science uh, is that a threat? I would actually say this is a big opportunity for uh, data scientists uh, to actually show 10x value for their corporates, for their businesses, and um, for their enterprises in general. Oh, that's awesome, John. You made me want to go <laughs> and uh, take that course that was being advertised by Stellenbosch. I really want to go and do it now. But thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for everyone else for participating. In case you missed it on the chat, we're looking at introducing uh, Bill Schmarzer on the next call for next month. I'm not going to say much about him now. I've put a link in there or you can look it up. That's Bill Schmarzo. He's written a couple of books and I think he's going to be a really engaging guest to talk about data, artificial intelligence um, and bring a perspective this time from overseas. He's based in the Central America. So that's going to be quite interesting. But until then, I wish you all well. Have a great week and uh, we'll chat to you all again probably in September. So I'll send out dates. Um, and a recording of this when it's all ready. So thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Cheers, Greg. Yeah.